Okay, so most diets um, recommend some sort of restriction or elimination, right? You can think of any diet and they have some magic bullet plan to help a person lose weight. Um, food is made of only four macronutrients. I've only listed three here because the fourth is alcohol and that's not necessary. The other three are necessary. So carbohydrates, proteins, fats, we need to eat all of those. Um, if you look at any diet, uh, some of them ask you to reduce carbohydrates or fats. Those are, those are the popular ones to go with these days. Um, but none of them tell you to eliminate them, right? Even something as extreme as Atkins or keto recommends a certain amount of carbs per day, and you're supposed to increase those carbs daily. Um, so nobody says to eliminate them. If you have somebody, or if you're considering eliminating a whole food group, that is, that is not a diet, that's an eating disorder. Um, so that's important to recognize and realize. Um, some special diet considerations, right, are celiac disease, which is an allergy to wheat products, typically. So again, that does not eliminate all carbohydrates, right? Wheat is just one carbohydrate, and there are myriad more. So even if somebody is celiac or thinks they're celiac, they should not be eliminating carbohydrates. Um, testing for celiac disease is really important. The blood test that is offered is not definitive. Um, the way to actually test for celiac disease is to be eating gluten, which is actually a protein in wheat. Um, so you need to be eating that because if you're celiac, it inflames your intestines. So then the test would be to take a biopsy of your intestines in that state and see if they are inflamed. Um, so that's a way to definitively diagnose celiac disease. Uh, we have vegetarianism and veganism here because some people are raised that way, eating that way. Um, Seventh-day Adventists, for, for example, are vegetarian. That is their practice. So um, being respectful of that. In eating disorder treatment, we always want to challenge that just to make sure it's not um, coming from an eating disordered place. Food allergies, similarly, of course, those must be respected respected. If somebody is allergic to a food, they should not be eating it. Um, I think this is for this slide, but all diets work temporarily. I think, you know, we might get some argument about our assertion that diets don't work. They do work temporarily. Like Fiona said, people do lose weight, but it is because of a calorie restriction. It doesn't matter what magic formula they've developed, they are all based on calorie restriction, uh, reducing intake. But the body responds, that's why they're unsustainable. The body needs certain things, it needs certain nutrients, and it will do everything in its power to get them. So that's, that's why these food cravings, this feeling of out of control when you're on a diet, um, and the reason it doesn't ultimately work. And, and induces shame in people, frankly, which is part of um, the whole culture around it. So if we can get rid of this good food, bad food talk, that's, that's really helpful. The same way um, we're talking about like eliminating, referencing people's bodies or commenting on them. Eliminating good food, bad food talk is really a useful thing to do. Um, I like this picture at its most basic. Eating is converting energy from the sun to our bodies. If you think about it, you know, plants photosynthesize, animals eat plants, we eat plants and animals, boom, you're eating the sun. It's a beautiful process really. <laughs> and we should all take a lot of pleasure in it. Um, but this good food, bad food dichotomy has really um, tripped us up, right? We really are using food as kind of our moral compass lately. It seems to me that as we lose religion, we move to food to determine if we're a good or bad person without just determining that on our own. So concepts like clean eating aren't very helpful because they really have no meaning, no definition. And they also imply that if you're not doing it, you're dirty eating, which doesn't make any sense. Um, you're just eating. Our culture has replaced religion with wellness, making the types of food we eat speak for the types of people we are. Making food neutral, just a source of nutrition and pleasure and nothing else is really important in dismantling diet culture. 
this is a tough one, right? Because all of our media, all of our literature, not all, obviously you guys are consuming some media right now, but most of it does put food into these categories. If you just do an image search on basically anything, you can see foods associated with people with different expressions, like the woman with the salad who's so, so happy. And then the person with the donut who's like, should I? All these images just feed into this concept that we need to determine what's good and what's bad. And if you look at it, like we love donuts, we love things that are delicious. So if you're in this good food, bad food dichotomy, when you want a donut, you feel like you're a bad person. And that makes zero sense. Like a donut is delicious. You should eat it and enjoy it. And that will actually, like the reduction of shame reduces um, the tendency to binge on that food later. It gets rid of that, that idea that, well, I've already screwed up, so I might as well go for it since I'm such an awful person. Like just getting rid of all of this trash uh, can really be helpful. We wouldn't even, we don't need diets, but I think if you could sweep away all this psychological trash associated with food, you wouldn't even see the need for diets. Right, and to the point you made earlier, with the exception of, say, a gluten-free diet if you have celiac disease or a nut-free diet if you have a nut allergy, right? Let's keep it, like, really specific in terms of the purpose. Right, right. and then just to differentiate, like, I'm a dietitian. My, my title has the word diet in it, um, and the difference between, like, the Atkins diet and a nut-free diet is that Atkins prescribes a way of eating and a nut-free diet is just what you eat, right? The word diet actually just means what you eat in a day. Um, but, you know, it's been used for something else lately. Yeah, and someone chimed in the comments as well, kosher, halal. So yes, yeah. religious um, orientations around diets as well. There's a yeah. lot out there. I think to unpack, you know, unpack the messy, unnecessary diet culture piece so that we can be um, open and respectful of what people biologically need or choose to do for religious reasons. Thank you. Yeah, correct. We absolutely respect those. Um, and if they're tangled with an eating disorder, we can untangle them and in a respectful way, but you do have to do that untangling work. Um, I want to talk a little bit about exposure versus abstinence. Um, there are some programs that promote abstinence. So I think one that's pretty well known is sugar, right? Um, there's about a billion books talking about how sugar is poison and it's ruining America and it's ruining our children. Um, it does seem to be the root of all evil if you walk into a bookstore. Um, what I practice is actually exposure to feared foods. If you feel like you have an addiction to sugar, it's probably because you're not eating it. It's probably because you're restricting it and you're fearful of it and you have these psychological impacts, but you also have physical impacts. It bothers me a lot when people talk about sugar being addictive because the brain runs on glucose. So if you look at it from that perspective, like it is kind of addictive because it's, nice. it's like how air is addictive. You know, you don't want to stop breathing it. Um, the brain demands glucose of the body. So if it's not getting it from external sources, food, it will create it from your tissues. Um, and that's, you know, it's great as a backup system in starvation, but it's not really something you want to put your body through. So rather than um, demonizing something like sugar or sweet foods, um, if somebody is having an issue with them, if somebody comes to me and says they feel addicted to sugar, uh, I start a program of reintroducing sugar and learning to enjoy it too, right? And like trying to reduce all that negative talk about it because it's just a food. It comes from sugar cane, which grew in the earth and came from the sun. It's, it's just a very simple process. Uh, there's no addictive qualities about it. So what I wanna do when I'm treating patients or working with people is um, take those foods that have such a high resonance for people. I don't know if anybody's experienced this where you buy one of your favorite foods and it's in the refrigerator and it's like on your mind all the time and you're really excited about it. It's all you can think about. Um, if you don't just enjoy that when you want to, that gets stronger and stronger. That food gets more and more power over you. You think about it constantly. Um, whereas if you're just like, Ooh, ice cream sounds good right now. Maybe I'll have some, then it's not such a big deal. If you tell yourself you can have ice cream whenever you want to, 
then it lowers in that resonance and it's less powerful. It has less power over you. So that's my goal for all of my clients is to allow them to walk the earth with total freedom of choice, right? <laughs> to not like freak out if they have to walk by an ice cream parlor. I want them to walk by that ice cream parlor and feel like maybe ice cream sounds good. Maybe it doesn't, whatever, not a big deal. Um, abstinence has not been shown to work. It's, it's the same thing as diets that I was just talking about. Um, people might be able to do it for a while, but it's unsustainable, uh, even socially, right? Food is very social. Um, so it might, it might induce a person to reject an invitation to go out or to see a friend or have a pastry together because they feel like they can't be around sugar. Like they are supposed to abstain from it. And so they can't see their loved ones anymore. Um, absent, the absence model um, comes from drugs and alcohol where it is pretty effective. And again, going back to that macronutrient discussion, drugs and alcohol are not necessary. You can eliminate them and never look at them again. Food is necessary. Uh, you have to interact with it three to six times a day, whether you like it or not. Um, so it doesn't, it's not an effective treatment. Um, intuitive eating is something I use in my practice. It's such a wonderful um, book. It's written by two Los Angeles-based eating disorder dietitians who worked with patients for years. Um, and notice that these, these uh, 10 principles really helped their patients get away from the diet mentality, um, accept their body, feel okay about their body at the very least. Um, and eat normally not and make food kind of like just a part of life, not the main part of life. That's the fallacy about eating disorders. I think people who are unexperienced with eating disorders think that it's people who have rejected food and don't interact with food when really a person with an eating disorder thinks about food 24 hours a day, like they dream about it. Um, so this can really help with that. Uh, the 10 principles reject the diet mentality. That's what we're talking about. Honor your hunger, be responsive to it. If your body is hungry, that's biological and it is okay to feed it. Uh, make peace with food, that's that neutralizing food and getting rid of good and bad foods. Challenge the food police, that can be yourself or other people like, oh, should you really eat that? Yeah, I should, I'm hungry right now and I should really eat it. Respect your fullness on the other side of the spectrum, um, being really mindful, like being aware of when food stops tasting as good as it did for the first bite, like noting when you're full, um, discovering the satisfaction factor, eating what you want, um, enjoying your food, honor your feelings without using food. So just being mindful of your emotional state. If you're an emotional eater, that's not a bad thing, but it's good to be aware of it. Um, respecting your body. We're going to talk more about that um, coming up, but um, just being kind to it, no matter what it is, no matter how you feel about it, treating it with respect and kindness. Um, exercising for pleasure rather than to lose weight and gentle nutrition. This is a chapter that was added later just to talk about, you know, actual balance and moderation and how to um, eat in a way that makes you happy and healthy and feel good and, and work to get rid of the guilt and the shame around eating that a lot of people experience. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of health at every size. Um, it's an important part of all of this. Um, I think we've touched on it a little bit when we talked about doctors. Um, so the principles are here. I think we have some more slides, so I'll just let you look at this, and then we'll move on to discuss them further. Oops. So health enhancement, supporting health policies that improve and equalize access to information and services and personal practices that improve human well-being, including attention to individual, physical, economic, social, spiritual, emotional, and other needs. So just not deciding what a person is based on their body, right? And also putting into place policies that don't just focus on weight loss. There's a lot of policies that are focused on weight loss. Um, with the obesity crisis, let me put that in quotes, um, 
weight has become, weight has always been a big uh, goal of the medical profession. So just expanding, expanding the lens to see the whole health of the person, it is not just about their weight. Um, are their economic needs being met? Are their social needs being met? Are their spiritual needs being met? Um, developing policies that speak to that a little bit more. Um, respectful care. This is important work for all of us. Um, we may, even if we talk a big game, we may have biases. So to be aware of those, to be aware of when they come up um, and to work on them. Like if you, if you feel yourself reacting to the sight of a fat person, what are you reacting to? What is coming up for you? Um, what do you think you need to do about it? And why do you feel that you need to do that? Um, making sure we're providing information and services from an understanding that socioeconomic status, race, gender, sexual orientation, age, other identities that impact weight um, are addressed and that we're addressing inequities in that uh, realm as well. Eating for well-being, I think we covered that with intuitive eating. Um, again, just reducing the shame around eating, um, making sure that you're enjoying it. Like it's an enjoyable activity. It's a social activity. It should be a happy activity. Engaging in life-enhancing movement. Again, it, not talking about exercise as a way to lose weight. Exercise is wonderful on its own, for its own merits, right? And it can take a number of forms. So really focusing on that rather than as a means of losing weight. All right. I think Fiona's gonna dive into the social and cultural piece. To be fair, we're both gonna dive into the social cultural piece. <laughs> we had a lot of fun putting this together. Um, so I love this quote, it's, it's, three decades old at this point, but um, a culture fixated on female thinness is not an obsession about female beauty, but an obsession about female obedience. Dieting is the most potent political sedative in women's history. A quietly mad population is a tractable one. And that's from The Beauty Myth by Naomi Wolf. Um, so just carry that with you as we continue to speak. All right. Uh, I alluded to this a little bit in the beginning, but really we want this third how to be anti-diet piece, right? We talked about weight stigma, we talked about um, diet sort of statistics, and then Claire just gave us a lot of really amazing information about kind of dispelling these diety nutrition myths um, and nourishing ourselves from a more neutral perspective. But I really want people to think about um, critically looking at how things have been marketed to us over the years and, and bring that back to that quote from the beauty myth, right? What is being, uh, what's the agenda behind this um, above and beyond the profitability of the diet industry? So really quickly, um, you've come a long way, baby. For people who remember when cigarette and tobacco marketing was really uh, ubiquitous, it's Virginia Slims were cigarettes for women and it, it was tied into slimness in the very name. It was tied into women's liberation early on. Uh, this ad, you can't read it, it's too small on the screen, but the little Virginia Slims did this whole marketing campaign where they came up with these fake historical scenarios. You know, so-and-so was hiding in the basement, smoking cigarettes, um, hiding from her husband, or, you know, it took her 25 years to smoke a cigarette in front of her husband, and it took her, him 25 seconds to pack her bag. They really built in this idea that smoking was women's liberation, right? That this was us reclaiming our status as being equal to men by smoking, um, and heavily marketed that. Uh, and and the appetite suppressant piece, the weight loss piece, the valuation of slimness and slenderness was really built into the marketing as well. And I, I bring that up because I think at this point in 2021, a lot of us have a pretty clear understanding of the history of um, marketing for the tobacco industry and the way these ideas were really falsified, the way, you know, Joe Camel targeted towards young people, Virginia Slims targeted towards women. And we see now 
um, how transparently awful that was. So if we can carry our knowledge about what happened with smoking in the tobacco industry over the course of the last century and look at what happens with things like alcohol and with dieting and wellness, it gives us a big picture understanding of the similarities between these things and the, the mechanisms behind them. I, the, the mommy juice, the wine mom, the wine mom has replaced the soccer mom. It's another um, sort of heavy marketing campaign that, that embraces alcohol use and even um, alcohol use to the extent that it's probably maladaptive and damaging, uh, really geared towards women. We see a lot of this these days. Um, and it's, it's pretty troubling. There's actually a great book out there right now called Quit Like a Girl that, that really unpacks the way that the marketing industry has pushed alcohol on women. And, and I think if we're looking at this feminist perspective, going back to the Naomi Wolf quote yet again, right, what is the reason behind pushing this towards certain groups of people? Um, how does that support a society that still is set up to be pretty patriarchal? Um, and then the wellness industry. So we've been talking a lot, a lot, a lot about the diet industry, diet culture, yeah, Quit Like a Woman is a great book. I keep seeing these comments pop up. Um, and I think di dieting has really shifted over to wellness, right? Weight Watchers changed its name to WW, and it's all about wellness right now. But it's still com conflating weight loss and thinness with health. Um, so wellness is... Um, dieting in disguise in certain ways. That's not to say that we don't want and wish for wellness as a, a well individuals, a well culture, a well society, right? But it's, it's health is not a moral imperative. It's a personal choice. There are also certain people that are never going to be healthy and that's okay. It doesn't make them less worthy of being a human being. Um, so how is this marketed and how is your worth being tied into your wealth and how are we co-opting anti-diet language such as intuitive eating and anti-diet concept into wellness and diet culture, intuitive fasting. Gwyneth, Pal Gwyneth Paltrow took a lot of flack for supporting this book um, a couple months back. So not to kind of dump that much more on Gwyneth, but it felt like an appropriate image to highlight this uh, point. So that's kind of the historical feminist perspective I want us to start with. And then if we move on to the next slide, we can talk about what's missing from that, which is that diet culture and eating disorders impact people of all genders, races, and ethnicities, ages, body shapes, and sizes, socioeconomic backgrounds, and abilities. Next slide, please. So, um, where am I? yeah, no, yeah, the, the one with the picture. Got it. Um, the feminist perspective is really missing the intersectional piece. And uh, you may or may not have heard quite a bit of inter about intersectionality the last few years. It's a term that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, and it essentially, this giant complicated Venn diagram, I think is a nice visual for what intersectionality means. It's um, looking at the intersection of various identities and how that frames the way we're walking through the world, the way that the world is looking at and treating us, right? And uh, the traditional feminist perspective really does focus on um, women, cisgendered women, white women, um, women in larger bodies were excluded from this conversation for a long time, women of color and black women and indigenous women were excluded from this conversation for a long time. Um, they're their histories, their hobbies, their health, their um, access to care, their access to generational wealth, all of these things lead to what we call social determinants of health. And they're so impactful in such a more nuanced way than um, what has really been discussed previously. So to give intersectionality its due and to remember when we're talking about things like this, a, a cisgendered white woman who identifies as gay or lesbian is going to have a very different experience in the world than a trans woman of color in a larger body. 
and it's just intersecting intersecting identities and and the more sort of identities you hold that have been marginalized by the status quo the more challenging things are going to be and the more we need culturally competent and really like cultural humility as as treaters and as friends and family members and as people who are working on our own recovery um, to understand the complexity of this and really make sure that what we're we're trying to do is change things for everyone, uh, not just for the very few. And this this feeds into the idea that we're trying to dismantle the stereotypes that eating disorders only impact young, thin, white women of, um, you know, some sort of wealth or means, right? There's a lot of stereotypes around that. That's what we've seen portrayed in media for the most part. Um, that stigma really prevents people from accessing care. Um, because they think that they can't get an eating disorder because they're male or because Claire touched upon this quite a bit when she talked about um, weight talk and even in treatment centers, right? Thinking that people don't have an eating disorder because they don't look like they have an eating disorder. Uh, putting people on restrictive meal, meal plans because they're in a larger body, making an assumption that they're the eating disorder they struggle with is, well, it has to be binge eating disorder. They're in a larger body. No, it, it can be anorexia, actually, right? It's um, people can be severely malnourished and very restrictive, and it, it doesn't necessarily reflect itself in a emaciated figure. So we just really wanted to touch on the intersectionality piece as we move forward and talk a little bit more in depth if we move on to the next slide um, about some of the race racial background of fat phobia and um, weight bias. Next slide, here we go. So I cannot recommend this book enough. I'm not sure how many folks have heard of it. Fearing the Black Body, The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia. Um, it's by Sabrina Strings, came out, I believe a year ago, maybe a little over a year ago, um, but not much longer than that. Won some awards in 2020 um, from the American Sociological Association. Really incredible. I've had the pleasure of seeing Sabrina Springs speak in panels virtual in this past year. Um, she, what she does is she really kind of digs into the history here. She takes a look at when culture shifted from valuing figures that were voluptuous to valuing and overvaluing figures that were slender. And she really ties it to the growth of the slave trade in America. She ties it to this growth in race scientists um, projecting that the differences between the races weren't just about uh, skin color or appearance, but really trying to claim that there were differences in behavior, differences in intelligence, differences in, in health and intellect, all to promote um, and to promote and to soften the uh, opposition to slavery in America. And the ways in which they did that was by stigmatizing Black bodies, and in particularly the bodies of Black women, um, by stigmatizing higher weight bodies concurrently. Um, so what we looked at was this uh, manifestation of the idea that Black people were um, overtly sexual and gluttonous and therefore they were diseased and they were fat, right? And these things were wrong or bad and it was evidence of racial inferiority and savagery. Um, so she does this beautiful job, beautiful heart heartbreaking job of making this connection between the thin ideal and whiteness. So while we were elevating whiteness with purity and thinness and um, shifting the general perception of what inferior bodies looked like. So it's, it's mind boggling the more you learn about this to really see these connections and to see how all these intersecting, going back to the last slide, these intersecting um, social issues and social injustices work together. So we go from sort of traditional anti-patriarchy feminism in the beauty myth and looking at uh, you know cigarettes and alcohol and dieting 
and we bring it to an intersectional movement and we look at how racism and the economic benefits of racism when we think about slavery have all supported each other in elevating like what is ideal and what isn't. And it's it's that tie into white supremacist culture that we again wanna encourage people to think about, think critically. When you wanna be anti-diet, we wanna unpack like why we've been taught these things. And if we understand why we've been taught them and the mechanisms behind it, it's a lot easier to move past it. So highly recommend this book. And I know we're um, gonna try to move on in a few minutes to Q&A. So I'm gonna zip through this. This is the second book that I highly recommend. Um, Sonia Renee Taylor, finding her work has been pretty life-changing for me. Uh, she wrote The Body is Not an Apology. The second edition just came out and there's a workbook as well. Um, really the idea that like, we don't need to apologize for our bodies. I'm not sorry that I exist in this world as a fat person. Um, a person, a disabled person doesn't need to be sorry for existing in this world with a disability. Um, it's the world needs to kind of apologize to us for not accommodating bodies outside that thin white um, norm that they've determined to be, you know, worthy. So Sonia has four pillars and 10 tips for radical self-love. I'm going to breeze through these, but again, fearing the black body and the body is not an apology. If you want to dig deeper into this stuff, I cannot recommend these books enough. The four pillars, taking out the toxic um, and the two tools that go along with that, dumping the junk, uh, which is really kind of doing a media cleanse and getting rid of all that sort of wellnessy, diety. Uh, social media, media type stuff that you're following and curbing body bad mouthing, which we talked about a little bit earlier when we talked about um, no diet talk and no body talk. Pillar two, mind matters, reframing your framework. I mean, that's a, a CV, CBT thing, right? That's what we're doing today is we're just talking about the critical thinking and the identifying how our thoughts impact our behaviors um, and even what's behind those thoughts and where they come from meditating on a mantra, find something that speaks to you uh, and, and, and your values and why you want to move past this and determine your own mantra. Sonia sort of talks about the phrase, the body not being an apology, becoming that for her um, and banish the binary. It's not all or nothing. There's, there's nuance there. Unapologetic action, explore your terrain. That literally means like explore your own body and get more comfortable with it. And that's really hard. That's like high level body image stuff. And I wanna acknowledge that that's challenging and it's something that we all do um, for most of our lives, right? So it doesn't mean you love your body every day. It means that you don't let it overtake your life when you're unhappy with it. And it might mean just like physically, like touching your body, exploring it, looking at it to the level you feel comfortable. If you're working with a therapist, if you're working with a coach, you like map out ways you can do this. Um, I know I share a lot of personal stuff, but being in a larger body in this culture, it's it's been my journey through um, body image work. When I think of exploring your terrain, I think, does anyone meditate? And you know, often when you get into a meditative pose, you sit comfortably and they say, rest your hands somewhere comfortable on your body. That might be your lap. It might be what I have found in recent years is that if I'm sitting cross-legged, getting ready to meditate, um, my hands drift to my stomach and I sort of cup it. And my stomach is something that I haven't loved my entire life. Um, and I find it inherently comforting to just sort of hold on to my stomach when I'm meditating, which is something that I never would have done 10 years ago. Um, I would have been probably avoiding even sitting in a position that made me aware of my stomach. Uh, so when I think explore your terrain, right, just if you do something like that, think about why. Does it make you uncomfortable? Does it make you comfortable? It's just, it's just me. It's there. It grounds me. It's there. It's someplace to put my hands and I like it. And uh it seems like a silly thing, but it's been a really powerful realization for me that like, hey, I'm okay with my belly right now. It's kind of a nice place to put my hands when I meditate. Um, be in movement. We talked about movement a little bit when we talked about health at every size, right? Movement being joyful and not punitive. Uh, it doesn't have to be focused on, on weight loss. Uh, make a new story. For anyone who's ever engaged in any kind of narrative therapy, we talk a lot about rewriting our stories. Um, and then collective compassion, be in community and give yourself some grace. So this idea of ourselves, but also in community and, and the social peace 
um, and how to have that kind of dialectical between what we're doing as individuals and what we're doing as a culture um, and compassion and grace. So those tips, I think, are just absolutely wonderful. And I can't say enough about um, Sonia and her work. Uh, so I know we want to save time for questions. So the social media piece is actually pretty quick, but I think it's really important when we talk about the toolkit. Um, you guys can probably tell, you all can probably tell at this point that I really like quotes. Uh, this is one of my favorites from Shrill. Lindy West is a writer and comedian. She's written a couple books. Uh, her more recent one was The, the Witches Are Coming and Shrill was made into a TV show on Hulu. Um, it was her first published book. Honestly, this where do you get your confidence chapter could be 16 words long because there was really only one step to my body acceptance. Look at pictures of fat women on the internet until they don't make you uncomfortable anymore. That was the entire process. Optional step two, wear a crop top until you forget you're wearing a crop top. Suddenly a crop top is just a top. Repeat. Next slide. And I think we sort of touched on this a little bit, but it's okay to not be body positive. It's not okay to be, it, it is okay to be not be fat positive yet if you're not there. We understand the discomfort that comes with this for any of us being in this culture and in particular for people who are in recovery or working towards recovery from an eating disorder. You know, this is a huge undertaking. You may be working on it your entire life. So we're hoping to just give you some tools that will help move you along the next step towards feeling more positively about your body. The term has been co-opted by diet culture. So sometimes we don't even use body positive anymore. Um, you might just wanna work on being neutral about your body. Like I said, not letting it ruin your day if you're not happy with how you're feeling in your body that day. Um, so that's just a little disclaimer that we wanted to throw in before I jump into the last part of the social media piece. I just wanted to add that body respect is really important. So that might be something you strive for. Like Fiona said, it's, I mean, all of us had, have bad body image days, no matter our shape or size, but your body deserves to be comfortable. It deserves to be fed. It deserves to be clothed in clothes that make you happy. So there's a distinction between body positivity and just being respectful of your body. Mm -hmm. And we know that a lot of people kind of cringe at the, hey, love your body language. So we're intentionally trying not to use too much of that. Like, yeah, love your body no matter what, right? Uh, that's challenging. It's some hard. folks... Yeah, some folks just are never going to love their bodies for whatever reason. Maybe they, they have chronic pain. Maybe their body doesn't align with their gender identity. Um, loving your body is really way an oversimplified concept. It's a lovely concept there's nothing wrong with it if you can get there, but um, we just, we've intentionally kind of stayed away from that. So my social media recommendations, I'm really going to breeze through these. Integrate your personal interests with your body positive or fat positive messaging. Um, for me, that's art. Taney Tinsley is an artist I follow on Instagram. I, I screenshotted one of her pictures um, here. She posted this the other day, said something like she only had like black pen and wall paint to work with. And I thought it was really beautiful. Um, I really like travel. I really like exercise and lifting weights, right? So my social media feed isn't just uh, fat positive, but it's, I love fashion. It's fat positive fashion. It's fat positive exercise. It's fat positive art. It's fat positive travel, because those are the things I'm interested in. That's what I want to follow on social media. So I've curated my social media feed and here's just a sample. Um, Kenya Freeman on the left there, she was on Project Runway a few years ago, and she was one of my favorite Project Runway <laughs> contestants of all time. I follow her on Instagram now. Phenomenal fashion designer, not shy about modeling her own clothes in a curvy body. Um, she's just great. I love her stuff. Uh, I follow a lot of hashtags like fat girls traveling because I'm a fat girl who likes to travel. Um, fat girls winning is another one. Um, a lot of the ones I follow are very gendered. Um, there's a lot of options out there for ones that aren't non-weight related fitness goals. Again, this is just a snapshot into Fiona's social media feed, right? You can take a look at your specific interests and intersect them with, um, 
anti-weight bias, anti-diet and uh, body positive or fat positive messaging and create a beautiful social media feed. Um, social media can be really problematic and really damaging, but it's not going anywhere. It's here to stay. So I really kind of recoil when people are like, ah, oh, social media is so terrible. It's like, it can be, but it can be wonderful. And you can really find community on social media um, and you can really find representation on social media. And as Lindy West said, it's representation. If you just continually look at people over and over and over and over again in larger bodies, in disabled bodies, in um, different gendered bodies, in, you know, the, the representation normalizes that and it, it increases your view of who's human and worthy because media has kind of pushed on us for decades and decades and decades and decades that only one body type is worthy of representation and that's just not true it really creates this kind of magical cognitive shift i don't know how to describe it other than to say do it and it helps yeah and this is from the hayes principles um examining your own bias so starting to interact with these images starting to normalize them like fiona said um, because we have we're in a culture of extreme bias so we need to start unpacking that ourselves Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, so many of us fall into this trap of, well, I, I can't be in a relationship till I lose weight, or I want to go on this spectacular trip, but I want to lose weight first because I want to look good in my pictures. I want to look good in my pictures for my wedding day, right? We've, we've built in this idea that we can't really live our life until we lose weight, um, which perpetuates that diet cycle. And it's, it's all a social construct. It's all something that helps make the diet industry money. Of course, we can live our lives regardless of our weight, right? Like, it's just really silly when you, when you really start to deconstruct it. Next slide. That's it. <laughs> this is our summary. This is our one, two, three, right? The nutrition reframe, the critical thinking, and the exposure and representation. Um, it, it's not a, a it's not a perfect package, but it's it's the best we've got in terms of how to be anti diet. And um, I know some questions have been coming in all along, so. We'll move to those now and we welcome them and thank you everyone for coming. Yeah, and, and thank you both for being here um, and sharing all of this great reassuring information um, really puts into perspective um, why we often have the thoughts we do and, and empower us empowers us to move away from um, the programs in our head. So thank you both. Um, we do have a couple questions. Um, one was, um, so someone, someone's mother made a comment recently to her that um, someone from their old school looked really small and so good. And, and this person says that she was upset by her mom's comment, but didn't really know how to address it in the moment with her. Um, any pointers for that? Can you repeat what the comment was specifically? She looks so small and so good. Ooh. <laughs> I think the decision is, do you want to address it in the moment or do you want to address it after the fact? Either is fine. If you can't, right? It's all about removing the shame from any of this and, uh, you don't want to shame yourself for not being able to speak up in the moment if you need some time to process. Uh, it's it's your own communication style. It's how, if you know your mother, how would she hear it? Would she be more defensive in the moment and more receptive if you brought it up after the fact? If more, you know, so be compassionate with yourself for how you decide. Um, and And just, you know, I think my response to something like that is, why does small equal good, right? Or I, I really, I really don't want to set her up for like any of that body hate that we all struggle with, right? Being in community with. So it's not like you're bad, you said a bad thing. Hey, we all struggle with this, right? Am I right? Kind of sucks, right? Um, I don't want to set her up for that. Can we like try to not, you know, I think uh, I always recommend sort of placing yourself on a plane of understanding why they said that and validating that and trying not to shame them and, and finding a common ground 
to say, and we're not going to do this because. Mm -hmm. I mean, humans are so reciprocal too. The reason we say these things to each other is because we want to please each other. And that is what we've been trained to do. So you could just not sort of respond to her direct comment, like, okay. And also I got a promotion at my job or I'm really happy these days, just kind of retraining. You can do that. And it's less confrontational just to not say thank you for the body comment and, and sort of remind them that there's more to you than that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Very good. Um, how about, uh, you brought up, uh, Claire, this issue of vegetarianism and veganism. And of course, when there's food allergies and religious beliefs, um, that's a different story, but are there ways to, um, to challenge vegetarianism practices in a culturally sensitive way? Yeah, so um, in my practice, I support vegetarianism. I don't say that it's not allowed or anything like that. And in the course of um, being with my client or patient, I just ask questions about it. Like, so tell me what it was like growing up. Have you ever had meat? Do you like it? Um, If they're receptive to trying meat, I want them to try it. Um, If they're against it, that's fine too. I just want to make sure it's not wrapped up in an eating disorder. My thing is I want people to have total control over food. So I want to root out any eating disorder thoughts or behaviors. So if a patient says, I, I'm never going to eat meat after this, like ever again, I, that's fine with me. I just want them to know that they can if they want to, that it's their choice, not, not driven by the eating disorder. Mm-hmm. And I think diagnostically, we work a lot on looking at when was the onset of the vegetarianism and the veganism. Did you grow up in a vegetarian family? Um, Or even if you did, did you kind of get into vegetarianism as a part of an animal rights activism or an environmental activism thing in high school? And was your eating disorder onset not for many, many more years? um, Versus did they happen right around the same time? And is that maybe a little bit of a clue that it's it was just a restrictive eating pattern that that yeah. you're eating or latched on to my and there's- favorite, oh sorry I was just gonna share I I worked with a, a woman years ago in treatment and she was very into social justice very um uh very progressive and she was a vegetarian and really we weren't even challenging that with her in treatment we accommodated vegetarians in that treatment center um And I was processing a pass with her one day where she'd gone out to meet her family for food. And she casually said, I had a bite of my dad's like pizza with sausage on it because I wanted to see if Mm. my vegetarianism was tied into my eating disorder or not. And, you know, obviously she was working on going out on passes and this and that and had been in treatment for a while. And she said, I think my vegetarianism is my values, but I'm glad I tried it. And I was like, you know, I just, I hold that, that she came to purely herself uh, or with the support of treatment, obviously, but it wasn't a specific task she was given by her therapist or her dietitian. It was an exposure. She just sort of in the moment decided to do herself. Um, And I hold that with, as an example of a way to kind of explore, you know, your values um, around eating. Right. And same with religion. I'm not challenging anybody's food beliefs that are religiously based. I just don't want to have them dovetailing with the eating disorder. Um, So if somebody is in a critical state, if they're not, if they're malnourished or undernourished, um, any religious leader will tell that person, like, maybe you shouldn't be fasting, even though our whole religion is doing that today, you need to eat because it's a medical necessity. So bringing that person into treatment or into the conversation and assuring that person that that's the case. And again, um, respecting their values and their religion while also helping them to tease apart what might be eating disordered. Like Fiona's example is great because it was self-driven, but um, I want to be in collaboration with any patient I work with. I don't want to overstep my bounds. So it's, it's their exploration of why they're doing certain things. All right, well, we're coming up on um, to the end of our webinar. I will, um, I'll pose one more question, but I just wanna do a little bit of housekeeping before that in case people have to leave. Um, Again, the recording will be sent out um, to everyone this afternoon. Um, You should get an evaluation uh, tomorrow. Please fill that out if you want your CE certificates. And we're really glad you could join us and we hope you can continue this conversation through your social media feed 
If there are people who would like to stick around um, and interact with Fiona and Claire, the presenters, we're happy to accommodate that. Um, I will go ahead and pose this last question and people are, are welcome to, to stay or to leave as necessary. But again, thank you so much for being with us for this very important topic. And thank you to Claire and Fiona and to Reasons Eating Disorder Center um, for, for sponsoring this webinar. Um, so the final question we'll ask in front of the big group is, um, if you think of eating disorder centers, how do you deal with the stigma of certain behaviors and certain bodies in body image groups? How do you ensure that all patients feel heard and safe? That's a pretty great question because it can be <laughs> difficult, right? The patients um, interact with each other. They see each other. They make judgments about each other. Um, so we are an exposure-based program. We wanna bring that in, we're a depth program. We wanna bring those things into the group and talk about them and unpack them, kind of like what we're doing here, educating about different body sizes, educating about health at every size. Um, health at every size is really valuable because it applies to everybody. Um, the alternate title could be disease at every size, right? Doctors are missing, they're, they're diagnosing disease in fat people and they are missing disease in slender people because they're so stuck on this body thing. Um, so educating the patients around that. We have a lot of patients who are dying from starvation and they were getting accolades from their doctor. Like, looks like you've lost more weight, great job. So um, again, just sort of like tossing out this dichotomy of, a thin body and a fat body and what those mean. Mm -hmm. I'll just add that we work really hard to be affirming of all bodies um, at reasons and that includes um, trans and non-binary bodies, that includes BIPOC bodies. Um, we we have staff that are representative of that. So patients coming into our program are going to see themselves represented in, in our staff. Um, and we're very, we have a zero tolerance policy for things like microaggressions um, or comments about race, gender, body shape, and size um, happening in our milieu, um, not only for the protection of our patients, but uh, you know that parallel process for our employees. So we yeah. we had dealt with some microaggressions um, being committed against some of our staff last year during the the protests over the summer, and and really met as a team to kind of talk about uh, how we're going to present to our client milieu that that that's not acceptable. So it, it goes above and beyond body shape and size. We just try to cultivate um, non-stigmatizing environment for all bodies. Very good. Excellent. All right. And there was um, also a question about getting access to the weight advocacy card that you referenced earlier, Fiona. Yeah. Um, you know, Reagan Chastain, she has a blog, Dances with Fat. She has created some materials, I believe. Um, there are great Facebook groups. There's a Health at Every Size Facebook group where there's some files within that forum where you can access and search and find some um, medical advocacy materials. Uh, my email address is... Um, on one of these slides, actually, I think if we go to the last slide, yeah. it's contact for Claire and I, I saw someone also asking about resources for children. Off the top of my head, um, Ellen Satter does some really good work. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, for parents. Ellen, yeah, E-L-L-Y-N-S-A-T-T-E-R. And then my, my, my girl, Sonia Renee Taylor, also wrote like a puberty book. Um, right. I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head, but if you Google her, you'll see that her other book, aside from The Body is Not an Apology, is geared towards uh, adolescents, so a little bit older than five to seven, but um, feel free to email me because I'll do some digging for more resources. I can rattle a few things off off the top of my head, but um, that would be where I would start. And ASDA, the uh, associ Association <laughs> Size, Diversity, and Health, um, their website has some resources as well. Very good. Well, ladies, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.
um, people are, are free to go. If you do want to stick around and engage in some informal Q&A, um, feel free. Um, we'll maybe wait a couple minutes to see who all is sticking around. But thank you again for attending today. Thanks for joining us. Yeah.